Welcome to the Adventures Less Travel Podcast. I'm your host, John Schwenk, and today kicks off the first of a two-part series on the psychology of adventure. People undertake adventures for a wealth of different reasons. To overcome personal challenges, to push yourself to the absolute limit, or simply just to pique their own curiosities about the world around them. Now, this is all fairly intuitive, but until recently, there hasn't actually been any formal analysis on the psychology of why this is so. But before we dive into the worlds of other adventure-seeking individuals, I want to take a step back. I want to try to learn what makes all these people tick through the lens of psychology from both an experiential and an academic perspective. So today, I'm sitting down with Paula Reed, virtually, adventure psychologist, polar explorer, and most recently, author of an absolutely fantastic book, Adventure Psychology, Going Knowingly into the Unknown, with Dr. Eric Breimer. Paula has the boots on ground experience from her own adventures, whether it's skiing across Antarctica to the South Pole, living with indigenous tribes, or sailing around the world by herself solo. All of this collectively complements the more academic and theoretical ground of Dr. Brimer. So between Paula and Eric, I'm hoping that these next two episodes shed light on all of the various shapes and forms that adventure can take on. So Paula, thanks so much for coming on. Let's kick this thing off. How do you personally define adventure and how have your experiences helped shape your own definition? Well, first of all, John, uh, thank you for inviting me on this and for the positive comments on the book. I um, must admit, I'm proud of it. It's a combination of efforts from various authors, so I can't take all the credit. Um, yes, so adventure is a bit of a slippery beast to define. And we've all had a go in the book and lots of people I've tried to define it over many years and over many cultures. So I shall answer for myself. I quite like a simple explanation, which is it's an exploratory experience. Um, that's it. I mean, that's that's quite a new definition for me, but I quite like it because I've always thought that adventure involves newness or novelty. So, so doing or feeling or experiencing something new or not knowing what's around the corner or the unknown, if you like. But I quite like the fact that it's an experience that is exploratory because it's not just newness, but there's a sense of movement or progress or or seeking or traveling with that. So um, that's my current favorite simple explanation. But I'd also like to add that I believe it has to happen out of doors, um, probably within a natural environment, in that if it was a place that was created by human beings, it's already been planned and built and thought through. Whereas I think adventure has an element which is um, the terrain and nature and the weather. So it's a, a variable context or environment, um, which quite often provides a challenge. So I would like to throw that in too. But that, they're my definitions. Yeah, it's that unstructured aspect of it. Now, do you have any instances or examples in particular that stick out in your mind that have helped frame this definition over the years? Like, is this something you've thought in retrospect or is this something that you've recently thinking about with all of the academic work? I think um, I only get asked for the definition in, in these interviews, to be honest, or when you write a book and definition seems to be really important. But, but for me, it's been a felt experience. It's been something that I've just experienced through all my adventures. And I know when it feels like an adventure, when it doesn't feel like an adventure, and that's it. You know, um, Eric and I have also described it as a state, a bit like flow or love, which involves a sense of um, the variability or the challenge. Maybe some skills are involved and definitely a presence or mindfulness is involved. So for me, through all the things that I've done, I just know... <laughs> And I know that's not helpful, that I'm on an adventure or not, or that hour was an adventurous hour compared to the hour before it, which wasn't so adventurous. So, so if we take my recent trip to Finland, which was in the Arctic Circle, um, there were hours within days that weren't adventurous, even though I was in an adventurous environment. And um, even just walking down the street was quite an adventure because it was in thick snow and a, a different country. But then I have challenged myself a lot in the past. So my appetite or, or my uh, my calibration of adventure is going to be different from somebody else's. Um, if I'd have got lost in the snow, 
then that probably would have been more adventurous as a as a feeling or as an embodied experience. But I didn't. <laughs> so so it does vary from person to person. I think we each calibrate it differently. Um, for me, one of my biggest adventures was when I I flew out to Cambodia, bought a dugout canoe off a local tribe, and just paddled down a, an unknown river. That was packed with a traditional adventure that you'd read when you were a child, you know, from a book. It was just completely into the unknown with an unknown craft, um, without a map, and full of uh, challenge and 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 the that spirit, that feeling of adventure, quite exciting, um, and being fully present and all that. So that's a long answer. No, yeah, that's great. So there's a part in the book about mindfulness versus mindlessness that I think is worth exploring. So mindfulness is all about being open to new ideas and exploring the unknown, hence the title of the book, right? But, um, and, and contrasting that with mindlessness, which is very narrow-minded, you know, kind of stuck in the way you've always been taught, not really going out of your comfort zone, not growing, not expanding your mindset. Now, there were three ingredients to adventure that was highlighted in the book, like the hindsight, foresight, and insight. So how do you how do you kind of differentiate between these three and why are they important tools in the adventurer's toolbox, so to speak? Well, um, there's a few things to unpack in that, but I think I think I, I relate it to experience. And we talk about people having experience and experience says. So the more we experience, the more experienced we are, of course. And that word we use quite casually, but I think um, when we go on an adventure, it's a peak experience. It's not a flat one. It's not an easy, straightforward, certain experience. It's got variability and challenge, sometimes trauma, uncertainty, weather, pain, um, all sorts. So it's a peak experience. And it can be peak up, so it can be a high plateau experience, or it can be a peak down where it's absolutely awful. But it, it makes us, I think, more porous and more open to learn and grow and uh, assimilate um, new knowledge or wisdom. So for me, the insight we get in the moment might be a combination of past knowledge and experience, the hindsight thing, which we might not even recognize or know is happening to us, but it might be a flashpoint of perception or intuition, it can be called, or... um, There was the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, who talked about sort of sudden, you know, sudden understanding or knowledge. So I think hindsight is just a buildup of all of our past experiences and can give us slow or a quick piece of wisdom. Insight in the moment is like, ah, okay. so if I learned that or knew this and therefore today or this moment. And then, of course, foresight is um, ideally, I think, when we're journeying or traveling, we are looking ahead quite often. So what's next? What's up? What's what's around the corner? Otherwise, we're a bit blind um, to to what's around the corner. So horizon scanning or, or looking to the future or looking or trying to at least anticipate what the next part of that journey or that challenge might be so that we're more prepared. It's all that sort of thing. So it's about experience and whether we call that intuition or gut or or whatever. But um, yeah, it's interesting talking about the three sites. So hindsight, insight and foresight, but it accumulates into wisdom, I think. Yeah, that's a that's a great way to put it. Um, there, there's actually a part, a, a quote in the book that adventure starts from a position of not knowing the path forward. It requires that one embraces uncertainties and explores possibilities. And, I, and yeah, like you said, I think really it's embodying the idea of, of being wiser and, and acquiring that wisdom. Um, yeah, so sorry, I just want to expand on that. My, my stat line is to how to go knowingly into the unknown. So, so the future is unknown. When you're on an adventure, it's all about going into the unknown. It's a venture. It's a future challenging undertaking. And we, we can never be certain exactly what the experience or the path will, will lead us to. But we can go knowingly. We can go with the right um, experience or kit or equipment or people or forethought or something. So when we talk about risk, 
it is risk management and risk awareness, but not necessarily the um, crazy risk taking um, type of personality that has been spoken about in the past. Yeah, sure. Now, now, do you think in terms of the the uh, th- there's a lot that talks about the environment and the, uh, specifically harsh environments. Um, now, that's not necessarily omnipresent for every single adventure. So, how do th- how how do you think they the environment factors into the type of growth that an individual will uh, mm-hmm. you know grow, so to speak. The reason I love doing these podcasts, John, is that, you know, with these questions, you get to really sort of dig around in your head and think, <laughs> well, what, what do I think about the, that question and what might an answer be, an answer? So great question. And I haven't, one I haven't exactly thought about before in that way, but as I reflect, as you ask that question, I'm thinking there are different types of strengths that uh, we can, you know, uh, make stronger or stretch or utilise and some are physical. So, so when you talk about um, getting fit for something or, or having to have the power to go up a mountain in a technically skilled way, then the strengths might be physical or in our skill set. However, then we look at the environment or the weather and it brings an added dimension, doesn't it? It brings the variability or the adversity, as you called it. So we can experience adversity as in hardship but it might be known or understood hardship um, or there could be the the challenge or the variability that the weather or a changing climate or climbing a mountain could be a sudden change and a sudden risk, which I think requires more mental dexterity and strength of mind to deal with. Whilst our body is still serving us, of course, with some hopefully some muscle left and um and managing the the chemicals and the fear and all that. So it's, a, it's quite complex, isn't it? The, there's, and that's why I like adventure psychology, because you've got the strength of your body, the strength of your mind, and then there's something like the strength of your spirit or whatever people want to call that. So the word psyche really is the soul of the spirit, which I think is quite an interesting one to bring in. So, um So, yeah, you've got your mental skills and strengths. You've got your physical skills and strengths. And there's something about a spirit thing as well that comes into play. And it's like uh, playing an orchestra. If if you've got a physical uh, challenge or activity, such as a mountain, plus the dynamic between you and the mountain, like what are, are you capable of and how are you feeling and how are your emotions right now and where's your fear levels, you've got that constant dynamic interplay but then you bring in the variability of weather or, or an avalanche and suddenly, you know, you've got another dimension to, to contend with. So, so the, the mental skills, I think, are, are very complex and, and, and developing and testing and stretching all of those of usually makes us stronger and more capable in the future. Of course, the other possibility is... Um, uh, a trauma that we don't necessarily grow from. So, for instance, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder rather than post-traumatic growth. But that's yeah. that whole another yeah. Yeah, sure. And and um, it's almost like you want to diversify, in a sense, your the 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 range of adventures that you undertake. Right? It's like when you exercise, you want to work out different muscle groups. So, with adventure, you want to get exposure and get experience in all of these different areas. I want to get into your own adventures personally. So I find Antarctica absolutely fascinating because literally for hundreds of years, explorers have been trying to go there. It's essentially a gigantic sheet of ice. And, you know, it wasn't merely just to go there and plant a flag. Like they went for a wide range of different reasons, whether it was curiosity, just pure scientific research or fame or fortune or otherwise. But for you personally, like I'm just really fascinated by what you did because you, you skied across Antarctica to get to the South Pole. Um, now, not sure if that's the typical way to do it or not, but I'm just, yeah, I'm just curious. Like, what was the, what was the rationale? Like, what inspired you to do it? What was it like when you're actually down there? Yes. Yeah, so, I, why did I go? Um, I believe in living life to the full, and that means, um, packing it as much as possible with these experiences because I proactively feel that if I do these things, I'll learn and grow more 
it's stronger, wiser, more resilient. Yes, selfishly, have some amazing experiences, but I just believe that life is a gift and we should make the most of it, really. And then obviously, if I can transfer any of that experience or wisdom or or, I, or thoughts to anyone else, then that's a bonus. But um, initially, I went because it was going to be challenging. It was going to be um, forcing me to really dig deep. And that meant for a year before I left even. So getting fit for it, all the training, tire pulling, um, and then obviously learning about nutrition and health and uh, cooking in a tent on the ice and so on. It, it was full of very um, taxing and stretching um, challenges even before I left the UK, you know. So, and that's kind of what I signed up for. I signed up for a massive experience that was going to be challenging that um, I was quite concerned about, anxious about, scared about, but I knew that um, it would give me a massive uh, peak experience and hopefully from it I would learn and grow and get stronger and tougher and wiser and all that. Um, it was it was an incredibly huge experience all in all. It was beautiful, surreal environment to be, an incredible place to land. Um, apparently the word awful originated from somewhere being full of awe. So it was an awful place to, to be, full of awe. Um, and yes, it was tough. It was relentlessly tough as I expected it to be although perhaps more relentless, as in 24 hours a day for 46 days, you have to be on your game. You have to be tough and switched on and fit. But I also got a injury called polar thigh on day seven, and there was a lot of talk about medivacking me away from skiing. So basically stopping my challenge and having a plane come in and pick me up and take me to the medical hut and, and call it a day. So that was a fascinating um, experience to go through because for two days after that announcement, I felt myself completely lose all my energy and motivate, motivation and drive and happiness and all those things. And just, you know, I just thought I was giving up. So, so for two days, I struggled with that. But then I decided on day nine to carry on. And, and I said, well, can't I just carry on? And the medics and the and the kind of leaders of the whole challenge said, well, yeah, as long as you can manage the pain and not get infected, then we're not going to stop you. So I'm like, well, come on then, let's let's crack on. <laughs> so, I mean, that was a huge thing. Two days to mull it over and to feel horrendous. And then 39 more days of a lot of pain and deterioration in my legs. So that mental challenge on top of anyway skiing in Antarctica was huge but I'm proud of it and I and I lean on that now and that's a point of reference for me so I my main lesson is that us humans are way more capable and amazing than we than we realize yeah and after the fact there's this feeling when you accomplish something like that such a momentous feat you look at challenges in the future and they don't seem that hard, you know, because you can always draw back from that trip and be like, I don't have enough money or I'm, I'm falling behind in, in rent or I can't, I can't do this or that or whatever your excuses. Well, it's not as bad as getting polar thigh on Antarctica, right? So would you say that that trip was one of the most difficult ones that you've endured of all your excursions? Yeah, it was one of the most. I've done I've done some other tough stuff and um I'm off to Ukraine and volunteering there in March, which I should think will also be um difficult in, in a different way, of course. But um but they say there's no courage without fear. So so I believe in pushing myself and varying the experiences that I that I uh put myself into because if it if I if I was an expert at polar exploration or as they call well polar travel, then presumably I'll get pretty good at it and it would hold less fear and challenge for me. But I choose to put myself in different environments. So I've sailed around the world. I'm cycling across. I've cycled across sixteen countries. I've skied the South Pole. I've 
hiked in West Papua and I'm about to go to Ukraine. So there's five or six very, very different disciplines or challenges there, but that's part of the point to keep pushing myself and not get too comfortable with it all. So, um, yeah, glutton for punishment, really. But um, it does make you stronger. So Eric has a really, I'm pretty sure it's Eric. He has a really interesting chapter in the book on fear. Um, Now, the majority of that chapter he, he speaks to more of the physical fear um, where there's some kind of foreboding of something bad to happen and how that can be life-saving in, in many ways. But there's also the fear of failure. Now, and among, among all, <laughs> among many other different types of fears, but for you personally, on, on day seven, when you were kind of at the, the lowest point there, what were you feeling and how did fear factor into that? So for me, that wasn't a fear thing so much as huge disappointment or or depression almost, um, which is a different energy, isn't it? It's a different emotion and different state. So for me, it was a very flat, depressing, um, lack of energy type state, whereas fear, I think, can actually energize us. So it was, it was different. Um, and it's, of course, it's quite hard to pick ourselves up or pull ourselves out of a more depressing state because because of that lack of energy. Whereas interestingly in the book, that chapter by Eric and Katrina Kessler, um, they talk about fear as a very focusing force and it's a benevolent um, guide, but it, it basically shortcuts all the other noise and gets straight to the point and gets you sort of ready for action. So it's, a, it's quite a different one. And I, I quite like the way it's dealt with in the book because there's a lot of talk about fear, um, feel the fear and do it anyway type of thing. But actually, I quite like the way it's it's described scientifically as a focusing force and as a shortcut to communicate with you so that you are cutting out all the rest of the noise and you're, you're ready for action as it, as it suggests. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, I think it's really important for people to break out of their comfort zones. And experience other cultures to walk a mile in their shoes, for lack of a better word. And, uh, e- you know, even in the U.S., there's subcultures where there's different ideologies depending on where in the country you live. The North is very different than the South, which is very different than the West or the Midwest. And the U.S. is completely different than Great Britain, even though we both speak English, right? So it's it's important because society tends to get trapped in their own narrow-mindedness and you know, it's, in some ways, they can they can look down on other cultures with disdain simply because something that that to you seems appalling, but for them, it's just a cultural norm. So, and and regardless of whether or not you agree with it, you at least have to acknowledge that that's their way of life. So, I think this can really only be done by venturing into these other walks of life. And I'm sure your experiences have helped shape your worldview in general. More from like a societal standpoint, how how do you think adventure parlays into expanding this idea of like expanding your cultural understanding? Hmm. Yeah, it it does. It does do that for sure. Right. Obviously, adventure doesn't have to involve travel. You can adventure in your own backyard. So let's let's take that example to start with at one end of the spectrum. If you are adventuring within a mile or a kilometer of where you live, you can, you can still have an adventure. Um, and there I suggest because, because adventure typically, um, facilitates you to be open-minded or present, then I think we are more open to receive new knowledge or information or experiences. So, so I suggest even if it was a local adventure, we are more open to receive and that can be other people or cultures or ideas however on the other end of the spectrum if we take um for instance my west papua which is probably about as unusual as it gets when it comes to people and culture um you know the the this is the the other half of papua new guinea it's the indonesian half and you've got pockets of tribes without roads or electricity um who have literally bows and arrows and they're wearing a penis cord and you know it's as extreme as a culture can get really I think 
And what I love about meeting these people, I've got a massive curiosity and respect for them. So just approaching them without being patronizing or assumptive, um, I've, I've, you know, I've learned over the years, but then to be so open-minded and open-hearted with this different tribe, and by tribe, I literally mean we are used to being in our tribe, as in football or work or play or home or community. So I mean tribe in every sense of the word. Um, and if you can approach with curiosity rather than assumption, because curiosity is anti-assumption, then you're much, your eyes are more open and your ears are more open and your heart and your mind is more open to just receive whatever it is they say and do. And it's a much more neutral stance. Whereas, so, so I use curiosity a lot. I think curiosity is a lovely neutral state to be in and um, it opens our hearts and our minds to others rather than being in conflict or, or creating barriers or borders between different cultures. And I was very privileged to be on a, a, a private audience with the Dalai Lama um, during lockdown, so maybe two years ago. And he just kept talking about we are one human race. And I so, you know, it's so true. He said, forget I'm a man or I'm a, uh, a practicing Buddhist or I come from a certain country or I'm a certain age. He said, I'm, I'm basically a human being and we all are. And that's what matters. And that's a very unifying stance to take. So curiosity for me is what I use when I travel. And while I was in West Papua, by the way, um, there was only three of us trekking in the middle of nowhere through the jungle. And when we would come up, um, which was quite rare, against somebody else on the on a similar path, like an elder from the local couple of huts who would be wearing not many clothes and would be much shorter than me. I'm, you know, five foot nine. These people are, you know, four foot nine. Um, so he might have a spear or bow and arrows and, and kind of no clothes on. But he would look me in the eyes and we would hold hands, we'd clasp hands. So we'd face each other. We'd have massive eye contact for a minute or two and we'd hold hands within each other's hands. And um, it was just the perfect way to greet a stranger. And it connected our, I think, our souls by looking through the eyes and all that. It was incredible. So I love that too, that memory of those encounters. That's really interesting. Now, before that moment, I'm sure that tribe also had their own set of preconceived notions about the world around them. So was there something that needed to be done to establish trust? You know, you go in with an open mind. You're hoping that they also have an open mind, but it might not be the case. So how did you approach that situation to establish like, I, I'm curious about you. You can be curious about me. Well, I think that was their way of doing it. To look into the eyes for such a long time, to read you, to understand you. You know, they say the eyes are the windows to the soul. And I think that was their way, which I love. You know, we don't do that. We we don't do eye contact so much and we don't hold the gaze for longer than half a second. But I think that is their way. I think, you know, they might have been wary. They might have, um, there's, there's politics, unfortunately, going on in West Papua right now. And they were smaller and more vulnerable than I was. You know, they were kind of naked with bows and arrows and, and, and slight in body. So there was a lot to be scared of on their account. But I I think it's just a wonderful way for them to try and read someone. And and if we go in with curiosity rather than um, challenge or assumption, then I think they can sort of sense or read that in your sort of micro expressions or something. Yeah. I mean, body language speaks volumes in and of itself. So now there's a lot of people that hear these stories, right? Take, take you as an example. You've undergone all these adventures one after another. Um, and so they, they get super excited. They get enthralled by this idea of going on an adventure. But for one reason or another, they fail to actually execute. They, they read about adventures from history or watch movies or see something on social media or even listen to this podcast, right? And, and they, they just can't, they, they want to, they're inspired, but they can't actually take the next step. Um, how, for someone with such firsthand experience, um, 
how do you encourage people like this to follow through on that initial instinct to take that leap of faith out of their comfort zone? Slightly depends on the sort of person because I get approached all the time saying, oh, I wish I could do that. I want to do that. I was like, well, go on then. <laughs> I mean, there there are many obstacles, barriers and reasons why we shouldn't or couldn't or can't do these things. But most of them, just by saying, well, GFDI, you know, you, you can. Uh, even if you are married or with children or um, haven't got much time or money, you can still make things happen. So part of it is just brute determination, really. Um, but it depends on the person, of course, and how what the what the reason is behind their um, their hesitation. Let's say so. Um, it can be gentle encouragement. So if there's a definite sort of fear or worry, then just a gentle encouragement to take one step, which might be. Um, Put your tent up in the garden, sleep in the tent in the garden. It might be one night camping on a campsite or it might be one night camping, um, wild camping. So so there are steps you can take from sleeping outside to sleeping, you know, in the wild. And then you could uh, do a bivy, which means basically sleeping in what looks like a body bag. But it's basically just a bag on the ground. Um, and then you could do some survival where you're, you know, you're living in the wild for three days. So it can just escalate, you know. So gently, gently, one step at a time. Going for a walk even can be quite adventurous if you haven't been outside or if you're stuck indoors or if you've got mental health issues or a lot of people got stuck in lockdown um, not venturing out so much and they got more and more afraid of then venturing out. So, it's, so for some people, it will just be gentle steps. For others, it literally might be a kick up the backside uh, and and that's what they needed. You know, because there's all these reasons and rationale why not to do something. And part of it is just flipping, you know, go and do it or make it happen or book the flight or sign the form or apply for the package or whatever it is. And everything in between. So, so, um, so I could ask as well, you know, as a female, things like, haven't you, what if you've got children? For me, unless the children are 100% dependent or vulnerable, I think it's good sometimes for the kids to see one of their parents perhaps go off and do something pretty cool and amazing. And and again, it's possibly Sorry? Well, yeah, yeah, depending on everything, you know, ages and situations. But, yeah. Um, so if you take a woman who's got two kids... Maybe there's some support somewhere else if she leaves them for three weeks or or two months even. Um, and if you explain why you need to do these things and encourage to um, engage those children, perhaps somehow either physically taking them with you or saying, this is where I'm going and staying in touch, they, they could well be proud. And also you can refine your strength of identity. Perhaps you had three children. So you know, there's quite a few parents that lose themselves in, of course, caring for their children or bringing them up. And then they lose their sense of self and their perhaps their strength or their previous courage or their previous spontaneity or fun they had. And and so there's a lot of positives. So basically what I'm saying is there's 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 30 reasons why we don't do these things. Everything from comfort to genuine fear. But there's lots and lots of ways to unlock that. But it slightly depends on the person and their circumstances. But I'd say, yeah, just flipping, go and do it. Because I'm not comfortable. I don't I don't always want to go away from my armchair and ski in Antarctica or recently go to Finland and get into the icy water, you know, frozen river and swimming in that. I didn't kind of want to, but I knew it was good for me and I knew it would give me an incredible experience. Yeah. And I'm, I'm see, I'm, I'm really fascinated by things in the limits, right? So, and in the lower limit, that's like what we were talking about, right? When everyone has an excuse of why they can't do something or, or even, you know, farther extreme where you have the, the couch potato who's like, I'm comfortable where I am. I don't need to decide I'm fine right here, which that's a whole different context now. And then you go the opposite direction and, and the totally high limit end of this spectrum where you have these extremely high achievers, you know, the ones who just go on one adventure after another, they break one 
Guinness record after another. They they dominate the competition, and you know they're they're the kind of people where the whole phrase "it's only impossible until it's done" comes from, right? So in that limit, on the other side, how do you prevent those people from becoming complacent? Because it's easy for them to become either arrogant or they they think they're better and they have no reason for anyone to tell them otherwise, or they just they go from this open-minded, this mindful mentality to this mindless mentality where all of a sudden they start to revert back to, I'm the best, I don't need to hear any advice from anyone else, or, or I don't need to keep going because I've already done it all. So contrasting that with everything we previously talked about, how do you encourage this group of people to, to keep going? Hmm. So you do ask good questions, John. Because um, <laughs> on the one hand, you've got people who are who are a bit obsessed, and I don't think that's who you're referring to. So just to deal with them, you get people who are stuck in you know a- achievement or adventure mode, but it's more of an obsession than a passion. It's where passion has has got too big, and they're kind of uh, like a drug. They're hooked on it, or they're um, uh, yeah, addicted to it. That's not so healthy, but I don't think they're the types you're talking about. Um, for me, as I say, I vary what I do, so I'm never comfortable. So as you say, I don't think I don't think you can have an all round amazing athlete or achiever who has actually exceeded and been brilliant at every single different type of country or discipline or challenge, because that would take I don't know thousands of years. So. So that's how I vary it. I vary the stretch or the or the fear um, by doing it, by choosing to do things that I haven't done before. They're all different. As was, that's what I was saying before. Um, but also, there's a there's a thing in positive psychology where um, which talks about life satisfaction. So eudaimonic well being and happiness rather than hedonistic. So if we put aside hedonistic, which might be the obsessed with uh, addicted to adrenaline types. We're looking at general satisfaction with life and being stimulated and and um, challenged and and stretched and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I think people working out what matters to them or, or finding some meaning in life becomes a bit of a solution to that. So it might be helping a charity out instead of conquering a mountain or it might be getting a master's degree, for instance, instead of conquering the mountain. So, so sometimes just a, a reappraisal of what matters to them and what where where their meaning is coming from. Uh, yeah, no, that that works. So, how can we transcribe the experiences that you've had and and many others have had um, as more anecdotal data? How can we transcribe that into an academic context? Uh, how, you know, whether it's experimentation or some kind of testing where we can put a more scientific flavor and quantify all of these things that we've learned, because obviously there is an impact, like it does affect us. And we, you know, it's, it's very clear. And the book goes into so many different future directions and so many, you know, um, open-ended areas that are still to be explored, uh, adventure psychology is a very nascent field. So I think, you know, part of some, you know, cementing it as a, as a proven field of, of research and a proven area of science and a distinctly different area of psychology, I think it's important to have some kind of standard, some kind of quantitative standard. So, so, so yeah, in, in, in your experience, like how do we get this field to stand up on its own two feet, so to speak? Yeah. So um, sports psychology has been around for over 100 years, and that's in good shape now, right? It's got techniques and interventions and measures and some scientific rigor to it. I think adventure psychology needs to go through the same thing. Um, So uh, there's there's a chapter in the book saying a long past but a short history. Adventure and psychology, if you like, have got a long past. You know, people have been thinking about psychology for years and have been adventuring for years and have gone through mental situations and experiences for years but the the history of adventure psychology is relatively new as you said 
Um, we've had wilderness therapy and outdoor education therapy and and outward bound and the scout movement and the opening of the national parks in the US. You know, they're, they're all kind of the same movement. Um, and there is years of study and expertise that have accumulated. So I acknowledge that. But what the book's trying to do and what I'm calling adventure psychology is trying to do is bring it all under one umbrella or one banner and separate it from sports psychology. Now, unfortunately, this book was published, um, well, no, unfortunately, but on the back, um, unbeknown to me when I was editing it, it says sports psychology on the back cover. And that has annoyed me because I'm trying to separate it away from sports. And so the very fact that Real Edge have decided to put that on the back cover is an irritation. Um, sports psychology is different. It's it's much more predictable and managed and within controlled environments and settings. There's rules and regulations and points and referees and kit and, you know, it's a different psychology. It's much more about winning and competing and peak performance. Adventure psychology is much more about endurance and mental well-being and dealing with the unpredictability and variability of the environment. And it needs its own it needs its own space. So my one of my bucket list of things to do before I die, apart from swimming in an icy river, is to get adventure psychology recognised, named and launched as a separate academic and psychological discipline. Now, I'm only one person and I don't sit in the world of acad academy, you know, I'm much more boots on the ground, as you say. So I would love to think that all the fellow researchers and scientists and psychologists and adventurers en masse around the world are going to get there and it will be a rebellion from the ground up. The book was contributed to by 21 authors from nine countries, 11 women and 10 men. And I'm so proud of that. It's such a global and inclusive combination of people from Australia to England and Alaska to Iran. Um, so I'm thinking it's a great start and the more people that bang on about it and thank you very much for in introducing me and Eric on your podcast the more people that know about it can talk about it and understand it and research it and do it yeah I, I mean in my personal opinion the best part about research is that it's an iterative process right you have a hypothesis you go out you collect data validate or disprove that hypothesis you collect more data, you update your conclusions, and the process keeps going on and on and on, and you get a more refined answer to the question that you're trying to solve. But it's always open-ended, and there's always future avenues and future directions for other people to build off the foundation that you laid. And it would be really fascinating to have some kind of like controlled treatment experiment design where you could, you know, you get a sample of 100 people all different kinds of adventures, throw them out in the wild, out of a lab experiment, you know, try to hold something constant and just strap them up with like, you know, a polar heart rate monitor, a Fitbit and have them log their food every day and just see, you know, longitudinally how this all plays out. You know, I don't know. I, I think about everything from like a statistics standpoint, but it's really exciting, you know, especially when it's something so new. So I think a lot of the work that you and Eric are, have been doing is, crucial to laying the foundation for others to to build off of and to you know get this thing off the ground yeah it will be it will be and as you say i've just come back from finland where i had a conversation at the university called alto but they were so proud of their equipment they had in their lab mostly around sport, sport and sports psychology and fitness which is fine but where's the magic of the adventure stuff being measured how can we really take into account the way the sunrise affected our motivation nine hours later? Do you know what I mean? So I think I agree there needs to be some rigor and statistics and data and science. But what frustrates me is I believe that that data needs to be collected out in the field, whether it's quantitative or quantitative, because there's that extra magic, as I'm calling it unprofessionally, that is brought about by being in the fresh air, looking at nature, getting dirty, falling over, whatever that is. And you can't measure that in a lab. So, yes, the the technical, the equipment is, is advancing. And there are people that I know who are developing 
the research and the measures through apps, for instance. Um, Nathan Smith, to name one, um, is has been developing an app for two or three years now, measuring our psychological functioning in the extreme environments and so on. And there's a company called Volibac who do technical clothing from the future where they're hoping to integrate clothing with technology to help or measure or protect or aid us when we're in tough environments. So we're on that edge, aren't we, John? And that's what's so exciting. And that's why I think the time now is so relevant to get adventure psychology talked about. Thank you on on your podcast. And that's why I want the book out there and for people to at least, if they know it exists, then they can put things under that umbrella and we can share best practice and share that iteration of knowledge and wisdom. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's exciting. It's very, very exciting. So it's really just a matter of getting the right heads to collaborate with one another and, you know, being able to formulate research. So there's a lot to unpack from the book, stories, research findings, useful advice and suggestions, the whole gamut. If you were to leave someone with a single takeaway from the book, I know there's a lot, what would that be? So I've just recently reread the book from a reading point of view rather than an editing one, which is a different experience. And um, I've written lots of notes. But the, the one thing that still sits with me is the symbiotic relationship between us and our planet. If we can look after the planet, the planet looks after us. And it's it gives us so much. It gives us calm and peace and presence and awe and health and vitality. And ideally, that's a two-way relationship. Fantastic. So I'm going to take a quote from the book and I'm going to end it there. People who shatter records, accomplish the unimaginable, push the boundary forward. And it's not until you take that first step and go knowingly into the unknown that progress is made. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Paula. I had a great time, learned a lot, and I genuinely thank you for your time.